Hello, YouTube, and welcome to the Bloomborough Top 10. I am Michael from Michael the Gathering, and I have here with me today one of my absolute best friends in the whole world, a true wizened sage of the magic sphere. I have Sam from the Draft Punks. Sam, congratulations on hitting a thousand YouTube subscribers and becoming a real channel. Yeah, my favorite thing about that is you've been ahead of us by hundreds for quite a while now, um, but now it's just a rounding error. It both just show we both just show one point one k or something. Ab so no one has to know how much you beat us by. Absolutely. And that being said, I think I have been lured here under false pretenses. Now I came here on the understanding that we were talking about ten really cool cards for really cool formats. But now, I suspect you're going to go on about like arena best of one standard or something. Now, I believe the exact nomenclature used was the 10 most relevant cards from Bloomborough, which I feel is a self-explanatory sort of situation. You know, it's the 10 cards that will be played the most in the formats that are, you know, played the most by Magic players which is best standard, best of one standard in an arena. Standard. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that. So anyway, I'm looking forward to talking about some modern cards. I do actually have a standard card as my uh, as my number 10 um, uh, card from Bloomborough. Uh, that card is Fountain Port. Fountain Port is a land. It taps for a colorless. You can pay two tap to sacrifice a token and draw a card. Three tap, pay one life to create a 1-1 one, one blue fish creature token. Four tap, create a treasure token. Um, the the pressure on colorless land slots these days in on, in all formats, but including standard, is, is pretty high. It used to be a case that a card like this would just be a slam dunk in standard, but we have so many good options these days that they really do need to be a cut above the rest. But I think this one is. Um, I think the, the best comparison point is probably... Um, uh, Mirex uh, and I think this is certainly comparable um, it's kind of the same sort of price to, to create your 1-1 one, one token but this one offering a bit of flexibility and then it can um, draw cards I think being the mainly, mainly the important one um, I think is going to be really good and I think we'll see this in a lot of decks that can afford that colourless land slot which isn't every deck um, but blue-white control type of decks will almost certainly want it um, basically, anywhere anywhere that Mirax has has popped up, um, I think we're we're likely going to see Fountain Port as well. Yeah, I can certainly see that. I mean, I can see the the sort of tension between Fountain Port and Mirax. I could certainly see a world where control decks are almost running one of each. Mirax presenting that sort of mm. inevitability with the toxic tokens that can't block, but Fountain Port obviously costing life to create the creature but creating blockers is going to be a huge huge deal not as much once you're getting into the stages of the game where people are resolving attractions and you know a fish creature tokens functionally not going to block any more than you know a might token is going to but it might <laughs> absolutely but fountain port is it's it's a much more defensive card and i i do agree that drawing cards is going to be a huge deal there's so many incidental tokens nowadays just in general magic that it's going to be i think much easier than people expect to feed that draw ability that's a great point yeah yeah you're right yeah you, you'll just end up with random um clues maps treasures tokens from other cards yeah that's a really good point i certainly know that i've played many blue white control decks that were generating maps off of their uh blue white man lands yeah that yeah would have otherwise they pretty much only get pointed at the man lands themselves and for fountain port to turn those map tokens into clue tokens is just that's really kind of incredible and i mean i can see why fountain port's not on my list because it is fundamentally it's a control card and i despise <laughs> that but you know i can see yeah. the value 
Yeah. And I... I, I really like the play pattern idea of... Because oftentimes when you've got your Mirex, you don't have anything to do on your N7, so you just make a token anyway, even if it's not going to do anything. Mm. And so I like the idea of being able to create the token and then on their next turn, chump block with it and sacrifice it to draw a card, which if you continue that pattern, that forces them to commit more to the board to be able to get through your like cantripping 1-1 one, one engine, which then feeds into the wrath coming after that so i could i could very much see this playing a, a really nice um uh kind of forcing your opponent into awkward situations in it with the with a blue white control deck absolutely and in a totally totally different space my number 10 is the adorable uncommon otter coruscation mage oh nice talk to me about this so this is again now, I'm coming at this from a space of I'm looking at best of one standard. So I'm looking for cards that have a good game plan and I'm looking for cards that have flexibility because sideboards are a thing that exists in other spaces. And so Corization Mage is a really solid engine piece for those red decks or potentially the red blue decks that Bloomborough is building up here that can churn out a bunch of face damage very quickly that also adds a degree of flexibility in that it can be dropped as a two drop and then get a bunch of face damage off a bunch of spells or it can be rolled out as that two trigger sources which is seemingly the kind of thing that you'd say oh I mean it's just two trigger sources that's fine the important thing is once you start looking at this in the context of having multiples in play, having mm. effects that, say, might bounce the Coruscation Mage back to your hand if you have protective abilities, and you start... Essentially, you're generating card advantage here because each of these 1-1s one is a full card. This is not a thing we've seen yes. much with a lot of the offspring cards where the 1-1 one one will be sort of incidental or it'll be a thing that you can kind of play around in this case a 1-1 one -one with Coruscation Mage's triggered ability is functionally just an additional copy of the card yep I completely agree um, and often the downside with some of these kind of blue red whether it's kind of spell sling or burn decks is when they pick off the um, the payoff the whole deck kind of falls apart. So even just the fact that this can create two of them, one of them gets removed, but then you still got one of them to actually kill the opponent. Um, I think that's really relevant as well. I think the thing that I like most about this, and perhaps we'll see more about this on, on your list later, I'm not sure, is the enablers for this sort of deck in standard seem really good at the moment. At least I'm thinking in terms of blue-red because I have a soul. Um, that we've got we've got two different non-creatures in Bloom Burrow that create a prowess token. Um, there's the, uh, the case, um, uh, I'm sure Michael will put it up on screen right now. The, oh, the yes. first chapter of which is, um, single blue create a, a one, one auto with prowess. The class. And then there's also, there's also the, uh, the sorcery with flashback. Yes. Um, the front half of which is, is the same thing. So having multiple spells that create the prowess creatures is quite exciting to me. Absolutely. Uh, that means you're not going to end up with a hand that's. You know, three monastery swift spears and a coruscation mage. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm quite excited about that. I like that. I like that pick. Uh, all right. Well, sticking with red, this this pains me severely to to talk about this, but it has to be done. I'm not devoting multiple slots on my list to it because it doesn't deserve that. But I've got a set of mono red cards that I think are gonna make mono red crazy good. Um, in particularly in arena standard. Um, and particularly in best of one, which is not a real format, but apparently people play it. Mono red um, famously underplayed in such a format. Yeah. <laughs> um, th so the three red cards I want to talk about are Sunspine Links, Ember Heart Challenger, and Blooming Blast. I think that that package is going to be really strong. But just so that this isn't a top thirty list, I'm just going to talk about Sunspine Links. Um, what the hell is this? This is so stupid. Get get this out of my game i hate this so much two red red four four 
players can't gain life, damage can't be prevented, and when it enters, it nugs each player equal to the number of non-basic lands that player controls. Samuel, I have devastating news for you. Mm-hmm. It is a format of 5-4. What did I say? You said 4-4. Four, four. That would be oh, that God. would be a yep. reasonable stat line for <laughs> such a creature. But no, we have a whole extra point of power because that's the era of magic that we live in. It's gross. Yeah. So if you intend to play any sort of fun deck in standard, and honestly, even Pioneer, I think this will be a player in Pioneer as well. Um, so, you know, if you're a domain player or anything else that has something other than 20 basic mountains, this thing's going to be a nightmare. Um, really the only way that I think you're going to be able to handle this card being prevalent, which I think it will be, is counter spells, um, which puts pressure on the format in an interesting way. Um, I hope it doesn't devolve into mono red decks with sunspine links and decks with counter spells, um, but that's certainly a possibility. It's also a possibility that mono red gets so prevalent in the format that the sunspine links isn't good anymore because everyone just has basic mountains. I also think because i'm not as high on sunspine links as many of these mono red doomers that you'll see online Uh, Mm -hmm. and part of that comes from sort of being a mono red player having that understanding of what are the things we're playing in mono red what are the things that we're after and sunspine links is it's fine it's good the the issue in sort of my environment is that again there's a lot of decks against which it is a fully dead card Mm, you know it's easy to it's easy to look at sunspine links and say oh look at these domain decks which incidentally are largely rotating out of standard with sunspine links coming in it's easy to look at sunspine links and saying oh this is a you know a four mana five four that prevents life gain can't have the damage be prevented and then it nugs your opponent for what uh if we're in magical christmas land here you know we're talking about drawing this off the top of the deck and it nugs the opponent for like eight which it sounds horrifying right but there's so many situations where i'm getting a sunspine links in my opening hand because you know i'm playing four of these because it's a good threat and i want to be playing it in my deck and then i'm playing this on curve and it's doing one, two points of damage. And at that point, mm. I mean, at that point, Sunspine Links is really more of a, a glorified uncommon in this space. Mm. And I think that disparity between the incredible highs that it's going to have and the really quite sort of slow, like bottom end that it's going to have mean that it is going to be a powerful card. It's going to be used in those sideboard formats also known as magic the gathering yeah (laughs) when i learned to play magic the gathering you taught me and neither of us had any idea what a sideboard was that was a later addition to the game and it is not magic as 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 is pure (laughs) <laughs> that's true no pure magic is no sleeves on the the asphalt on your high school um playground oh when it's rained just before oh yes yes now we're talking after you've like unwrapped your deck from the elastic band that was holding it together oh yes now yes. we're talking um yeah you you are right you are right um it's um it's definitely gonna have a bit of a disparity in the the matchups that it's good good in versus poor in it's entirely possible it's a sideboard card because we've seen mono red decks in the past be very fast and low to the ground um pre-board and then board into a slightly slower version of the deck um the uh the the famous hazaret mono red deck did that quite successfully and this does remind me a little bit of hazaret yes absolutely um so that's very much true i think this will be a player in pioneer as well um basically every deck is almost entirely non-basic lands um and the players can't gain life text is very relevant with amalia being at the top of the format oh yes at the moment as well um so i'm curious to see it's uh just to be clear i hate the card regardless of how much play it ends up seeing um but my my guess is it will be 
My guess is it will be a player in standard. Pioneer will depend on if it can actually get mono red up to playability because it's not at the moment. Mm. Um, but I, I do think we'll see it in uh, in a couple of different formats. Tell me quickly about yeah. your other two. I, I just want to touch on here the other two sort of like mono red cards you have here. So mm. you've got Booming Blast, which I, I've looked at and I've been like, oh, okay, you know, it's a little bit of damage to a creature and then potentially some damage to the face if you want to gift a whole treasure token, which seems like a lot to me. Yeah, so the the obvious point of comparison with this is um, uh, Searing Blood and the original version of this effect that Michael's going to put on screen because I've forgotten the name of it. Um, these cards were really, really good enablers for mono red decks in their day and even continuing to this day in modern burn. Um, the reason being that sometimes the tension in your burn style aggro deck is whether to point your shock effect at your opponent's creature to keep attacking or their face to try to get them dead. Yes. Um, and so these Searing Blaze, Searing Blood effects have always been amazing because they clear a blocker out of the way and nug the opponent. So it's a little bit mana inefficient. It's two damage for two mana or three damage for two mana. Um, but the ability to do both of the things that you're looking to do um, has been really powerful in burn style decks in the past. The fact that the gift on it doesn't work against the purpose of the card is exciting to me. There are some of these that are aggressive leaning that gift a food that can then gain the opponent life. I'm not very high on those. Um, or there are some that are like board management that gift them a fish. And in that sense, they're kind of working against themselves. The fact that this just gives a treasure, it can potentially let your opponent accelerate a bit. But the fact that that doesn't work against your game plan, I think will end up being worth it. And on that note, I'm going to put a pin in your third mono red card because it's okay. on my list much higher. Okay, cool. Let's, res- uh, let's talk about it higher up then. As a, And the other reason that I'm putting a pin in it is because my number nine is exactly the kind of creature that you're going to be wanting to point Booming Blast at, which is Bright Blade Stoat. Which, ah, nice. Yeah, okay. Which is... Another uncommon, I I have generally, I found that when I look for relevant cards, I tend to find them more at lower rarities than I do up in, say, Mythic. I find Mythic cards can be fun to make a YouTube video out of, but when you actually start looking at the things that affect the metagame, it's your cut downs and your bright blade starts. And this is a two mana white soldier that's coming in right as Thalia rotates. And obviously Thalia rotating is a huge deal for any format that she leaves. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's not just for her static effect of making non-creature spells more expensive. It's also having a two mana 2-2 with first strike is so difficult to attack into that it is one of those things that can single-handedly hold the ground against basically any aggressive deck in best standard. I don't know. I don't know that in a sideboardy world, a simple line of text like First Strike Lifelink is going to be as impactful. But certainly on ladder, Bright Blade Stoat is a huge deal. It's got a relevant creature type, which turned out to be rarer in this set than I was expecting. Mm, yeah. Uh, we're not talking about Weasel here. <laughs> no. Non-human, non-human Soldier is very much becoming a distinct deck, once again, from the White Humans deck. Uh, mm. You're going to feel much better about playing your Yoshin Frontliners and your two-mana core Soldier with the Anthem effect that I can't bring to mind right now. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was there was that whole there was the whole soldiers deck from DMU um, with uh, Harbin. Yes. Um, so yeah, when you when you first mentioned that, I was hesitant because I found that these kind of white aggressive two drops 
tend to live and die on their creature types oftentimes. Um, and Weasel is not supported, but the more you've been talking, yeah, there are still plenty of, um, uh, of relevant soldier effects in standard that could, yeah, very well get there on this card. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, the fact that it's, it's such a pain in the butt for mono red in particular, which is just the meta in best of one. Um, yeah, that positions this quite nicely. So I, I kind of like that point. Yeah, it's not going to be a star in any of the sideboardable formats, or as Samuel would love to call it, real magic. Uh, but I think in the actual day-to-day experience of most people, uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of Bright Blade Stoat, and we're going to be pointing a lot of cutdowns at it while that's still in standard. Yeah, and if you can if you can get even just one plus one counter on it um, with uh, a, a Illuminarch Aspirant type effect, um, this this starts to get pretty out of control because yeah, at that point you cannot cut down it, you can't blooming blast it, you can't shock it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, I had, I didn't really have that on my radar, but the more you talk, the more I'm kind of liking that. Mm-hmm. Uh, next up for me, uh, I've got another red card, but a little bit of a different one. I've got Flame Case Gecko. So one of red, two, two. It's a lizard warlock. When it enters, if an opponent lost life this turn, add black, red. And then it has an ability one and a red, discard a card, draw a card. So the obvious point of comparison for this is uh, Burning Tree Emissary mm. from many years ago. Um, and that's a card that has been uh, borderline broken on on many occasions. Um there have been points in both Pioneer and Modern's history where it, there have been calls for its ban. Um, it does some, it does some really stupid opening draws that are, that are tough to beat. Um, I, the, the condition on Flame Cache Gecko is a little bit more. They do need to lose life in a turn. Um, but I don't think that'll be particularly hard. And I actually think there's a whole suite of, um, aggressive Black Red Lizard cards. Um, that have the makings for a pretty good um, aggressive lizards deck. Um, and so even if you're not doing anything combo-y with the gecko, even if it's just a matter of play your one drop, attack them, play two of these and another two drop on on two, um, that's nuts. And that's very, very hard to beat. It is one of those cards that I look at it and I see this creature that has this huge sort of explosive combo potential but then at the end of the day is a vanilla 2-2 after it's done its thing i mean it has that activated ability but i think we all know that that's there just in case you don't have anything to combo out with uh that's it the fact that it's got a fail case of well i suppose the fail case is you haven't dealt damage to them but assuming that you have you have a way to use that mana which burning tree emissary didn't necessarily have uh where if you've got that extra land in hand or you um, you want to dig for something in particular. The fact that it's got that built in, um, I don't think that's uh, something small to kind of go, oh, okay, yeah, no, that's nice as well. I think that's a, a big part of the upside of the card. Something I'm excited to see with this card is if it's going to be relevant that it puts out uh, two colors of mana without needing the colored mana in the first place. You, you can start mm. the chain with a single red pip and then it's going to generate multiple black mana as you either you have multiple of them in your hand or more realistically as we look into the future and into the spaces where this card will become abused it's as the cards being say looped and played repeatedly on a turn yeah yeah exactly yeah if you can find a way or if you can find a way to clone it yeah every turn um yeah, there we start to get silly. And so, yeah, if you've got some sort of cost-reducing effect going on, um, even thinking of something like Ruby Medallion in Modern now, where you can reduce this down to just one mana, now you've got a mana positive 2-2. Two, two, yeah. Um, which was never possible with Burning Tree Emissary because it had double-coloured mana. Um, so if you haven't played with this card a card before, it might look a little bit innocuous, might look a little bit like a limited card, but going off the history of Burning Tree Emissary... Um, this is this is a scary card, and this can do some uh, some pretty gross things. Exciting. Speaking of two mana two twos that can do scary things, my number eight is Thorn Vault Forager. Ah, nice. Which yeah. I had to pick from one of the many many two drops that add mana in this set because 
there's really just so many at the moment. And with the knowledge that we're getting Lanolor elves in standard down the road, I think it's going to be interesting seeing the kind of space that people get into picking what their mana dorks are going to be in their decks. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm sure Sam knows where I'm going with this one. But for those of you who haven't come across this combo already, Thornvolt Forager is important because of its second ability. So first of all, it just has tap add green. Secondly, it has tap forage add two mana. And the important part is not the add two mana, it is the tap forage, because we can then with uh, Heaped Harvest, I believe is the name of the card, uh, yes. get the double ramp trigger, where on turn three, we play the harvest, we rampant growth for a basic land, and then on sacrificing a heap harvest, you get an additional rampant growth effect which we can do with the Thorn Vault Forager as a cost. Yeah. Which is insane. Yeah. To then get two mana, which, you know, just off the top of my head, cards in green that we can cast for two mana that might benefit from having lots of basic lands in play. Or, I don't know, maybe there's something that has power and toughness equal to the number of forests that you control. Maybe there's another card that we have in standard that's too green that lets you get a basic forest and rampant growth that into play i the, the deck basically builds itself look you and i are not the same the fact that that's where you are i thought i thought this was all leading into aftermath analyst <laughs> <laughs> see unfortunately i look into the future and i see aftermath analyst and i recognize that this is the world where the new Capenna Lance have rotated and Aftermath Analyst's price has crashed back to Earth and nobody's playing it anymore. We're going to talk about this further up my list. Oh, oh I'm, I'm That's so That's right. Ready. I've put Aftermath Analyst at number one just because that card is so awesome. <laughs> no, we are going to talk about it later. Oh, good. Um, no, I really like that. I, I do really like that. And honestly, just having a Mana Dork that can tap for two mana is huge. Absolutely. A two, a two mana dork that can add two mana. Mm. Um, have we seen that at all before? I can't bring it to mind. Certainly. Yeah, it's certainly not a common effect. That's um, It is very explosive. And yeah, being able to combine it with, with the heaped harvest um, is very cool. Yeah. I immediately then want to throw a spelunking in there as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, so those lands that you're getting off your heaped harvest are coming in untapped and so on the turn that you do that you're generating four mana horrifying that's exciting horrifying that's very exciting that's a that's a very powerful ramp start absolutely um and several of those pieces have seen standard play already yep. all right spelunking uh was in the the aftermath analyst deck um so this is this is cool um, I don't know if that last ability will ever do anything, but it doesn't even need to. Just though, yeah, the combination, those first two is, um, that's very exciting. Yeah, that last ability, that four mana tap, search for a score card. Look, it's the sort of thing that I would love normally to see on a mana dork. You know, it's a bit of card selection. It's something for the card to do later game as the, the deck has sort of petered out of energy. But searching for specifically a squirrel card uh, is almost trinket text to me. Like, I'm sure yeah, there will be yeah. commander players who are overjoyed to have this in their deck and will drive the price of this to the moon. <laughs> yeah. uh, but for but for you and I, the people living in real magic land, uh, I don't know that that's going to do much more than filtering additional copies of this out of your deck. And I could definitely see it just doing that. Yeah. Um, and that's And that's totally fine. Um, yeah, last thing I'll say, this this was on my short list as well. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is, I, I know you like to talk about um, game design on the channel. I love that they moved away from the one mana dorks, Birds of Paradise, Lana War Elves, Elvish Mystic. Oh, yes. Into the two mana dorks because the the design space that they opened up when they did that, the, the range of two mana dorks that we've had in the last six or seven years has been so interesting to see. And it's so much fun to watch which ones end up being constructed playable and which ones just miss the mark. Because um, the power level on Birds of Paradise and Llanowar Elves is so high that they, they can't do much with them. Um, there's not a lot of space to play around. Like Gilded Goose, I think, is the only other one that we've seen 
Yeah, um, those one mana dorks are fundamentally the kind of thing that has to be balanced around. You either hit it turn one and it does something insane, or it becomes ultimately irrelevant later in the game. Um, yeah, you know the that this is this this is the sort of space that your moxen and your black lotuses uh occupy you know not to not to make a direct comparison but that is sort of the play space and that's ultimately it's not a super fun play space it doesn't lead itself to games that are interactive and dynamic mm, whereas yeah. you know these the two mana uh, the two mana dorks really do put you in that space where you have to still build around having something to do either turn one or you're getting to these cards later. It's also fundamentally you're going to build your deck differently if you're building a bunch of one mana dorks that ramp into three mana cards than if you've got two mana dorks that are building into four mana cards because as you've mentioned sort of many times when you're talking about uh, building a limited deck, getting multiple two drops down is a valid way to spend four mana, Mm. which just doesn't happen in sort of the space of ones and threes. And so it is one of those things that just sort of mathematically naturally lends itself to a more wholesome and healthy play space. Yeah, I agree. Because uh, last time Lionel Riles was in standard, there was a lot of talk about how dangerous or how kind of polarizing Lionel Riles is because it really puts a check on turn one. Your opponent plays the Lionel Riles on turn one. Do you have the cut down or the shock? If not, you're probably going to lose. Um, whereas these two mana dorks, they're able to push the power on them because the the range of interactive spells that are available at two mana is so much wider. Um, and I think that's much healthier because there is nothing worse than when your opponent leads on the Llanowar Elves and your first land is tapped or you just don't have the, the one mana interaction and then you're facing a 5-5 before you've played your second land. Um, it gets really frustrating. These two mana ones open up more opportunities for interaction but also more flexibility and more late game power um, in exchange for that. And I, I, I think that's a better design space and I really like that they've they've explored that more in recent years. I agree. There's There's nothing more frustrating than an aggressive deck having access to a turn one one mana card that just really accelerates their game plan and can't be interacted with except in a few very specific niche ways anyway kumano is rotating finally (laughs) (laughs) my brain just went to ragavan but no you're absolutely Yep, nice, good. <laughs> um, good riddance to that stupid card. Speaking, all right, let's talk about some. Uh, let's talk about some cooler cards. Yes. Um, my number seven is Igra, Eater of All. This is three black green for a six six legendary creature, elemental cat. It has ward, sacrifice a food. Other creatures are food artifacts in addition to their other types and have the usual food ability. And whenever a food is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put two plus one plus one counters on Igra. This is, first of all, just a very cool card. Um, but second of all, there are so many combos um, that you can pull off with this. The most immediately exciting to me is in Pioneer, uh, two Cauldron Familiars can loop each other infinitely with Igra in play and just immediately kill the opponent. Um, and Cauldron Familiar is already a perfectly playable card. In we did Pioneer. it. We broke Cauldron Familiar. We broke Cauldron Familiar. Um, then even if you want to kind of bring this back down to standard, if you want to combine it with uh, Camellia the Seed Miser, um, which is a, a three mana, three, three menace that says whenever you sacrifice one or more foods, create a one, one squirrel, which will then also be a food with Igra. Um, so if you can combine that with any sort of sacrifice effect, um, we're, we're really off to the races. So I've seen, I've seen a bunch of different combos. I think the Cauldron Familiar one in Pioneer looks like the strongest, but combining with Camellia in Standard looks strong as well. Um, uh, and I'm sure a few other people in the comments will, will be able to mention a few others. 
Um, and that's in addition to the fact that this is just a giant beta. Um, it's a five mana six six with a ward effect very similar to Vein Rippers. Um, so this is exciting. I think this is going to do, if not infinite combo, cool synergy decks in both Standard and Pioneer. Uh, I'm very excited to see see what this one's going to do. Yeah, absolutely. I am all for these big black green effects. I think that Wizards tends to make these really interesting. So if you can compare sort of other big archetypical effects and they tend to be a bit underwhelming, your big red mythics, your big sort of blue octopus type creatures. I think there's just something really enjoyable about the black green space that allows for magic to just come up with really fun play patterns i think and i think this is a really interesting one i i'm not a hundred percent sure on the combos that are going to come out of this but part of that is just that i'm i'm a best of one standard player and the pace at which you have to assemble a combo in that environment is so fast that even Igra just being five mana is itself surprisingly large as a hurdle to overcome. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's a really nice illustration of why um, best of one is just uh, not a real format. Um, you know, as soon as you have to say five mana means the card card doesn't even work anymore. Um, I think you've immediately invalidated your format. So that's that's lovely. But what I like about this is that it doesn't have to be an all-in combo deck. You know, this is not um, a Splinter Twin style deck where the two cards on their own oh, individually don't do that much. Um, both Camellia and Igra are totally fine, just kind of mid-range cards. And if you've got a mid-range deck that's just kind of popping out squirrel tokens and foods that you can sacrifice to various effects you've got just kind of a good synergistic mid-range deck um, and if that's got some sort of combo finish great even if it doesn't i think there is a lot of potential there and the fact that it can churn out foods mean um means that it can it can compete with mono red on some axis at least that is going to be a really interesting space for black green to be in just the amount of sort of life gain that it can outpace mono red with mono red already struggles with black green in many of their sort of like opening hand gambits uh just because black has access obviously to cut down but then Mm, black green also runs my brain has failed me i went to say nissa i'm not glissa thank you yeah yes the death touch first rack card that should never have been printed i (laughs) i barely remember what most of the text is on that card you know, people make that joke about Questing Beast, but <laughs> Questing Beast had lines of text that were actually irrelevant. Every line of text on Glissa is relevant, but they're all printed after First Strike Death Touch. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would be lying if I said I had not forgotten about a line of text on Glissa before. Um, uh, yeah, and yeah, so Golgari Midrange was already a good deck in standard. I think keeps most of its pieces as well. I think that one is one of the one of the winners out of this rotation. I so so here's a fun thing about rotation, mm. and especially about just the way that the general audience builds decks is that sometimes the thing that gets people to actually play a better version of the deck is the card holding them back rotating out. Uh, and in this case, I believe fight rigging. Is yes, fight rigging is a uh, Streets of New Capenna card that has historically been a black green card. It's been in there with uh, Shakedown, um, and just that's been sort of the idea of what the black green deck is for so long that people are still doing that, even though it's terrible. You know, <laughs> you've got yes. people who have you've got people who are still like, oh, black green is phyrexian obliterator plus fight spells yeah (laughs) and like that's our deck yeah but you've got people doing that and it's like okay but also you know that this is the same deck that could be running glissa and punch spells like yeah come on here um yeah and and it is very Uh, much a case of like it's a fantastic deck that's hampered by 
lots of people just playing a bad version of it. Yeah, I guess I don't don't see that much when I play Real Magic. Um, but that's interesting. To the same point, though, the fact that I think that mid-range deck's biggest predators in Domain and Team or Analyst are largely rotating is going to be really big for it as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right, what have you got at number seven? My number seven brings us back to the first turn of the game. It's Fabled Passage. Yeah. Now, I yep. mean, it's the question really for me with Fabled Passage was not... Is it going to be in my top 10? It's where is it going to be in my top 10? Because this is a card that can't really be overstated. It's effect not only on the game and sort of the decks that it's in, but the wider metagame. You know, part of part of Fabled Passage being in standard is going to be in that it represents a shift away from the Streets of New Capenna Triome lands into a world of much more streamlined there's going to be a lot more two color decks where the fact that fabled passage allows you to run these basic packages that are coming into play untapped for no cost really later in the game is going to be a huge change for a lot of people who have been just building soups with lands that they ha- happen to have that just cover all of their bases at once yeah um yeah, I co-sign all of that. Uh, the only reason this isn't on my list is just because it was a reprint um, and I wanted to talk about new cards. But yeah, everything you said is true. This will be a major, major player in Standard. Um, and it's worth noting that I think this is the best of the uh, the late game mana fixing lands that we have in Standard now. Because um, we've got the fast lands from All Be One. Yep. And, um, and OGGI. The, and, yeah, and the pain lands from... Uh, Dominari. Where were they from? Yep, and Brothers War. Yep. Um, so we've got fast lands and pain lands, and those are aggressive focus lands, so early game lands. Yeah. But we're losing the triomes, and we're losing the... I don't know the name for them, the late game... The, the three or more slow lands. The slow lands, yeah. So we're losing both of those cycles, and they were the late game um, mana fixing options. Yeah. Really, all that we've got coming in with Bloomborough is Fable Passes. I assume we'll get some more with, with future sets, but for the moment... Fable Passage is our best option. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you are interested in uh, in playing... Oh, sorry, I suppose we do have the Man Lands. We do have the Man Lands from yes. um, LCI as well. Um, so those are going to be your options for slower decks. Um, and it's worth noting, Fable Passage has a bunch of synergies that you can do with it as well. <coughs> Aftermath Analyst, for example, <laughs> maybe. Yep. Could be an interesting one that yep. we could talk about. Um so, you know, the loss of the Capenna Lands is pretty huge for that sort of effect. But, hey, maybe Fable Passage does something there. Um, last time it was in Standard, it was combined with the Landfall on Omnath, which famously broke Standard. Um, and I am still doing that in Pioneer. I'm a Pioneer Niv player. Um, and so Niv plays Fable Passage just to combine with Omnath. So um, it's more than just mana fixing. The fact that it adds a card to the graveyard. Uh, if we end up with Landfall again in Standard, it's multiple Landfall triggers. Um, there's there's a lot of cool things you can do with this and I'm really happy to see it back in standard Fable Passage is one of those things where it's not just you know part of the engine grease or the sort of fuel that keeps standard or whatever format you're looking at running it fundamentally changes sort of the environment around it yes yeah yeah absolutely um yeah, it's going to be a major player. Also, they never miss with Fable Passage art. It's always great. Oh, it's fantastic. So good. Uh, all right, my next card is also another uh, another slow game card for Standard. Maybe Pioneer, but certainly Standard. This is Beza the Bounding Spring. Two white, white, four, five, legendary creature, elemental elk. When it enters, create a treasure if an opponent has more lands than you. Gain four life if they have more life than you. Make two one one blue fish creature tokens if they have more creatures than you. Draw a card if the opponent has more cards in hand than you. Uh, that's a lot of text, and that is a very nicely sized body for a white card. Um, I see this playing a similar role to the card that Michael's going to put on screen now um, that saw a lot of play in the white control decks. This was the, the one in a white one that made creatures if they have more creatures than you, gained life if they have more life than you. Um, uh, draw a card if they had more cards in hand than you. This saw a lot of sideboard play 
in in the white control decks um, all throughout its time in standard. Um, I think Beza will continue to do that. I think it will probably be a sideboard card in at least the hard control decks. Um, but I would not be surprised to have this see this in main deck play, uh, maybe as a one of in a blue control deck, or even if there's some sort of white kind of slow white mid range deck. Um, you don't need all the modes to make this really good. No, uh, absolutely If it draws not. a card and gains four, that's incredible. Mm. Um, and it does the things you need it to do. If you are behind on life and board, it fixes both those problems. And that's what those control decks really need to do, particularly against a deck like Mono Red. Um, so I see this playing a, a similar role to uh, that card that's on screen. And, um, or alternatively, the kind of Bane Slayer Angel role that those white control decks will sometimes, um, have out of the sideboard. Um, obviously it doesn't have lifelink itself, but if this is a four or five with two one ones and four life, oh, great. Um, that's going to be incredibly impactful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think an interesting takeaway from this also is that, uh, Sunset Revelry, the card in question, uh, Saw a lot of play in best of one, uh, not the kind of a lot of play where it shows up on websites like untapped.gg because it's being net decked everywhere, but it was the kind of card that reliably hit enough meta decks that you could just stick it in pre-sideboard as all the best games are played, and it would be a perfectly good card. Uh, part of that was the fact that it was two mana and mm. when you're on the draw and your opponent has gone turn one monastery swift sphere swift spear into turn two felden you know two mana gain four life get two creatures is going to be the thing that keeps you in the game and it's absolutely worth it being a dead card sometimes i think the fact that bezar is a four mana four five makes it a really really interesting evolution of that role i think it will show up in more decks realistically than sunset revelry did just because it's never a completely dead card the way that revelry was yes yeah 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 even if it's like complete floor you whiff on all the abilities that probably means you're winning and you've just added a four or five to the board yeah um, absolutely. the fact that that's going to be the floor of the card i mean i'm very excited mm. about um and it's going to create a very different sort of play pattern to what you described with Sunset Revelry um, in that it's probably going to be a matter of the control deck or a mid-range deck will spend turns one through three interacting with the board, countering a spell, turn four, day of judgment, wipe the board, pass it back to the mono red player who adds another creature, and then the white control player gets to untap, play a four, five, make two fish and gain four life. That's it. The game's over. I will say... You only get the two fish if they have two creatures. Thank God. Otherwise, this would be... A, an, oh, true. An incredibly reliable four mana, six, seven worth of stats, which true, uh, right. only green yes. is allowed to have that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how much play this will see outside of a control deck. Is this a good enough four mana play for a mid-range deck? I could see it, and I'm I'm curious to see how that how this one plays out. I certainly think so. Um, I think what will be interesting to see will be if there's a decent two mana play that decks can hold up, so that on curve, if a deck can on the draw uh, on turn five play Beza and then play their land for the turn. And then they could hold ah. up their extra mana and their treasure token that they've gotten for no penalty. Yeah, that's a great insight. Yeah, it plays a little bit like um, uh, a little bit like a claim jumper sort of card. Not that I mm. kind of saw any play, but we've seen yeah. versions of that in in Magic's past that have um, where yeah, if you play it just slightly off curve you get the ramp effect and then yeah in this case you're able to hold up two mana that treasure token comes into play untapped that's a that's a great point that's very exciting yeah and i think that 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 potentially being like you you could see a world where your i mean it's your turn five but w what is turn five in a 
controlling matchup where you're excited to hold up two mana at that stage of the game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where yeah. you're you're keeping a four five on the board. That's that's a real threat. Like even if it's getting chump blocked by tokens, because apparently there's going to be lots of fish tokens running around in this standard format. That's still that's a very real threat. It's going to draw maybe a card's worth of removal, and that's before we've gotten into any of the other modes going off. Totally, yeah. And we're now at the point where the blue control deck or the blue control deck can play Restless Anchorage, Fountain Port, or Mirax and Baser. Boom! That's it. That's all you need for win conditions. Absolutely. Um, and I like that Baser will close out a game fairly quickly once the blue control deck has things under control um so you know we don't end up with 50 turn blue white control games like we've seen at some points in the past i mean there's a counter example historically i just i feel like if i say it i'll bring it into existence and if you sort of squint hard enough at the card you can see ah it was white it was i think it was four mana back then it was a four five playing it gained you some life and it tended to clog up the board when there was a number of them on both yeah. sides of the field yeah it's um it's interesting that you bring up siege rhino because you're right that there's a comparison with baser there's also a comparison i think with sunspine links oh interesting yeah yeah four mana big guy that comes in and and nugs and the second one is just scarier than the first so man we've got some powerful fours in standard absolutely um, give me give me fun to see where yeah, which one which one's going to shake out what have you got at number six uh number six i don't have a four i'm allergic to cards that cost that much mana and so <laughs> i have a two i have the new uh life gain card in standard essence channeler yeah nice now no longer do we have to live under the tyrannical reign of a card that sits on the board uh gains plus one plus one counters and eventually just becomes indestructible now we have a creature that wants to interact wants to sure grow but it also wants you to lose life and i think that that is going to create a much more interesting deck I can imagine seeing Essence Channel in a deck that's actively running Pain Lands to proc it on your oh, turn. Oh, great. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And it's this is one of those cards that I acknowledge this is not powerful. You know, you're going to play this and there's going to be a non-zero amount of games where even if you play this and immediately proc it, to gain life it's still going to die to a cut down which is devastating really mm. um you know that's that's just absolutely going to lose you the game and it's one of the reasons why life gain is fundamentally just you know not as played or as reliable as totally random example mono red yeah, I so I had this on my shortlist as well. I didn't end up including it because I just relied on you to put it on yours. Um, we've seen Ajani's Pride Mate decks do decently in standard before. Never really kind of take, never really kind of take off and dominate the format because you make your Ajani's Pride Mate a nine nine, and then just block it. It's fine. The fact that this one jumps into the air is a noticeable difference and the fact that even when they draw the go for the throat effect to kill it it makes your next creature big instead there's something here that's enough upgrades on ajani's pride mate that i'm interested i i do think there's something here now i do now i do i have to ask you what your opinion is on this situation when this dies because it's actively threatening the opponent. Do you put the plus one plus one counters on just a, a token that you have instantly sitting around, or do you put it on a Malia and accelerate that? <laughs> That's cool. Because I guarantee you that is going to be probably the main way that it gets played, at least in best yeah. standard. It's going to be in a Malia yeah. decks. 
Yeah. And I think that's how it's going to be played potentially in Pioneer as well. Um, so Amalia combo is possibly the best deck in the format at the moment, depending on who you ask. Um, it is in the conversation for being hit with a ban next month. Um, if that doesn't eventuate, I'm not an Amalia expert and that building that deck is very tricky. Um, Essence Channeler could very well be an option for a deck like that, especially if it's trying to pivot into a less combo oriented build post board. Um, or even if it's just a one-off that you want to be able to court of calling for. Um, yeah, there's enough going on here that I, I, I do think this has pioneer legs as well as just standard. That's fantastic. Actually, now that you mention it, yeah, if you, if you have this in play when you do the Amalia wild growth walker combo, you end up with a, an even larger Amalia. Amalia. Double the size. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is not super relevant because normally the Amalia is big <laughs> enough to kill them, but <laughs> that's kind of cool. Yes. Look, my guess is that probably won't be a major player in Pioneer Amalia unless there's some anti-combo tech. Um, like if people are playing enough unmoored egos to strip the Amalias out um, and the deck just needs a different life gain win condition, um, I could see something like Essence Channel being the option there. Now, my number five, I think we'll see play in both Standard and Pioneer and in one case, Modern as well. Um, so I've put two different cards here. They are slightly different, but they play in similar ways. These are Eddie Merck Crab, which is five blue blue for an elemental crab. It's a five five flash that costs one less for each instant and sorcery in your graveyard. It enters tapped if it's not your turn, and when it enters, you tap up to two target creatures. Um, and uh, Chest Burster Swarm is seven and a black for a six six elemental insect that costs one less for each creature you each creature card you own in exile and in your graveyard with menace and death touch. Um, so to talk about Eddie Merc Crab first, this is obviously in a similar sort of space as Telerian Terror. Um, and there's been an entire mono blue deck in standard since that card was printed, um, built around those sort of effects. Uh, and we've still got Haughty Gin in standard, I believe. Um, yes, we do. So this one being not just a big chonker, but one that actively locks down their board when it comes in is massive. Because um, I think anyone that's played that deck would know that so often, like you play your two Telerian Terrors, but by that point, they've got a 6-6 six, six in play. Yeah. And there's just, there's nothing you can do. You're just kind of stuffed. Mm -hmm. Or they've got two 4-4s. Four mm -hmm. And you also can't attack unless you've got a bounce spell in hand. Um, it's a it's a pretty common play pattern with that sort of deck. So if you can get to the point where you can go Terra, Terra, pass the turn, and then on their turn, play your Eddie Merc Crab for two mana, tap down both their big creatures, untap with 15 worth of stuff and a, a free board that you can attack into. Massive. Massive. Um, I think this will be a real game changer for those blue spell slinger Talarian Terra decks in standard. Um, and it could even be in a blue red style deck with your, your Coruscation Mage as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think this is a, this is a very exciting one. Um, the Chest Burster Swarm plays a different role. I see this as, I mean, it's entirely possible it'll just be a main deck card in some sort of standard creature self mill combo deck um but in older formats this will be a sideboard card for creature based graveyard decks to bring in against graveyard hate. so it will play a similar role to um crackling drake out of pioneer phoenix so that that deck will often bring in the crackling drake whenever there is a risk of a rest in peace or an unlicensed hearse or whatever it might be or a leyline of the void um, so that they have a powerful threat that can work even if their graveyard is being exiled. And so if you've got any sort of grave crawler deck or soul flayer deck, whatever it happens to be, um, that is just going to massively struggle with a rest in peace in play. Now we've got a good option that can fit in with that deck's main plan and fight against the graveyard hate. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited for, for both of these. What, what are your thoughts on these in, in standard? Uh, I'm excited for both of these cards. Um, 
I considered putting them in my lists, but I felt like maybe they were a bit self-explanatory. Um, I actually, until you told me that about uh, Hulkbuster Swarm, I n- never would have seen that as really an avenue for playability. I think it's entirely possible that that's a thing that causes it to see just straight up even in best standard play because mm. pre-sideboard graveyard hate is becoming increasingly a reality. I mean, we're seeing control decks that are running uh, unlicensed hearse, uh, which you mentioned, just as a decent card that can provide quite a bit of late game sort of threat Mm. while incidentally also just screwing over quite a few you know otherwise perfectly innocent combo decks (laughs) yeah um and worth remembering rest in peace is still in standard so if there does end up being some sort of cool graveyard deck potentially with uh igra that we talked about before yeah um then yeah this is definitely a uh either a main deck or a sideboard option Eddie Merck Crab, I think, is super important. I think it's an important part of the magic ecosystem uh, for those players for whom Mono Blue uh, was too expensive to craft with four whole rare wild cards required for the single set of Haughty Gins that they play. Yeah, that is that is hard. Um, I, I do feel sorry for those people that have had to uh, spend such a fortune to build a deck. Um so yeah, I'm glad that we have we have options for for such paupers. Yep. Yeah. No, that's um that's good. I, I hadn't actually thought of that. Yeah. No, that that potentially creates an entirely rare, free, standard playable deck. Yes, and indeed one that's not uh, absolute garbage, like the yeah. uh, ninjas deck that thankfully is rotating and therefore will force people to stop playing it. <laughs> yeah um i'm a big fan of the mono blue deck as well i think it's i think it's really cool uh very frustrating to play against but it's it's a cool deck um it's very it's it's very fun it's very interesting to pilot yeah it's so fundamentally different to pretty much any other way of playing magic Um, agree and i Um, i love that eddie Merck crab is adding more dynamic choices to that mm. uh I've yep. been, that's been one of my gripes about the deck has been that Telerian Terror is just a card that eventually you draw it and then eventually it's just a one mana 5-5 five five with Ward, which is the least interesting part of an otherwise really fun deck. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And if you're a fan of those sorts of decks um, and you haven't done so already, go watch the um, the Mythic Championship top eight that was won by Autumn Burchett um oh, she yes. played the mono blue tempo deck from uh dominaria uh guilds of ravnica era standard um and i have very very rarely seen someone with such a, a mastery of a, an archetype so if that's a deck that you like um i would strongly recommend going and watching that it was just brilliant to watch so if competitive magic is your thing um yeah it's very good stuff what did you have in your top half uh speaking of mono color decks uh, mm. My top half uh, starts number five with Poor Patch Recruit, uh, which is a one mana 2 1 rabbit with trample uh, and offspring for two. And then, whenever a creature you control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, so this is your uh, your ward trigger, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control other than that creature. So, what we have here is a one mana, two, one, or three mana, two creatures that buff each other very quickly. Because this is a card free of the the modern magic curse that is once per turn of clauses. And I think that this card is most interesting when it's viewed in uh, relation to what is rotating out, which is that Currently, Ascendant Pack Leader is the green uh, one mana, two one of choice and can be a very awkward card when you're building your sort of mono green uh, play just above curve and just sort of do big Timmy things deck. 
because it's a card that really it feels like it wants to be played late game and get bigger but then never gets quite as sort of like big and useful as you want it to yeah poor patch recruit is never going to have that problem you know playing this turn one you're going to love it i mean it's not going to trigger right away but also as a one mana two one it's going to grow your evolving creatures it's going to trigger all of your creature cast abilities and then casting this with its offspring ability in the later game is going to make a board of any size even if you have one creature that you already had on board is going to make this this board basically impossible to get over without fully wrathing it and only some decks have wraths unfortunately uh yeah no you're right um this is this this was on my on my shortlist as well and very nearly made my top 10 um again i kind of relied on you to put this in here um this is yeah this is nuts um show this to your average savannah lions enjoyer um and just watch them lose their mind um you said that it, it provides some card advantage in the late game that's true if you mean turn three <laughs> so you know the fact that our one mana two one with two relevant abilities prevent potentially comes with two copies of itself on turn three. Oh, that's scary mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's very scary especially since we're coming into a standard with land of elves yeah, that's gross. Is, and is we've it, got a bunch of good mono. We've got a bunch of good mono green cards um, coming in as well. There's Keen Eyed Curator, mm. which is a green green three three um, that effectively has Delirium becomes a seven seven Trample, and it has Scavenging Oozer's ability. Um, and there's a there's a decent three drop that I'm blanking on the name of uh, as well. So there is a very a uh, scrap shooter is the one I'm thinking of. One green green four four reach and if you gift them a card it destroys an artifact or enchantment Mm -hmm. um so there's a very real just like mono green stompy deck coming in um so if you were a fan of the uh the old lana or elves steel leaf champion deck from uh from dominaria standard uh this is real i think this is a, a very real deck coming into standard i'm gonna describe to you a situation that uh you outlined yeah, earlier when we were discussing Lana or Elves, and I want to catch your reaction to it in your face cam here. Oh no! So this is uh, you're on the draw, you're on the draw, uh, and I go turn one Forest Lana or Elves. I can see. I mean, I mean, valid, but you you have a <laughs> you have a cut down in hand. <laughs> okay, yeah. You go um, tap land. You know, I'm I'm terribly sorry. You open with say a fabled passage. You get a tapped plant. Yep. You get yep. a tapped swamp. Yep. Uh I go turn two double pull patch recruit. And you're staring at the cut down in your hand. Yeah. Your turn two do you point the cut down at anything? Right, you might even be better off just trying to yeah. build a board, or do you do you kill the Lanawar Elves, adding two plus one plus one counters to your opponent's board? Yeah, right. It's a nightmare. That's truly Actual horrifying. Nightmare. That's that's very very scary. Um, I'm regretting this card is not on my list. I'm actually regretting it now. I uh, that's very scary. Uh, I I think yeah, we're we're kind of facing a standard where mono red, mono green, mono blue at the very least are looking like very real decks um which yeah i think is great especially if you're a little bit more of a budget focused uh arena player power to the free to players absolutely speaking of my number four is an uncommon uh this is thought stalker warlock this is a two and a black two two menace it is a lizard warlock when it enters choose target opponent if they lost life this turn they reveal their hand you choose a non-land card from it and they discard that card otherwise they discard a card um so three mana two two enters they discard a card not amazing but is it still at least a two for one yep uh if you can get that thought seize mode though uh oh boy oh boy um so i mean we can we can build this in a lizard's deck that's focused on getting those damages in goes well with our gecko from before but good lord can you imagine turn to bat take their removal spell Pack in with the bat next turn. Thoughtstalker, Warlock, Thought sees you again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is this feels like this feels like scam, modern scam levels of strip your hand apart 
in a in a standard deck. Um, and worth noting, speaking of that, this does not need to be cast for that ability to to trigger. So if you reanimate it, if you flicker it, if you point a not dead after all effect at it, uh, you will thought seize them again if you've damaged them. Um, these sort of uh, low resource game cards, um, these cards that kind of reduce the the available resources for both players, um, have proven very potent time and time again. The black red mid range deck in Pioneer um, is a really good example of that. The scam deck in Modern also a really good example of that. Um, this might look I don't know if this looks like a limited card to other people but this looks like a nightmare especially in combination with, with Deep Cabin Bat in standard yeah Deep Cabin Bat is a huge huge part of what makes this card good and that's ultimately just there's sort of two kinds of people there's people who understand the true horror of Deep Cabin Bat and people who look at it and they see a 2 mana 1-1 one, one that goes net zero on cards no, this is... Deep Cabin Bat was already in standard terrorizing people with Geeks and Shield Red, and this is just an additional thing that Bat can do. Yeah. And this and that's all putting aside the, you know, if we want a magical Christmas land with such an evil card, which I mean we should come up with a new term for what is the most pain that we could inflict with a card, this is an effect that you could feasibly... Uh, trigger at instant speed and instant speed discard is something that should never be overlooked because it is so unfun as to be actively designed out of the game yes yeah um yeah if you can combine it with there's a couple of um a couple of cards in the the frogs archetype in bloom burrow that are designed around flickering cards um, and so, yeah, if you can flicker this in every one of your opponent's draw steps, done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's gross. Yeah. Um, my uh, whatever the question of like which of Magic's game rules would you change? My answer to that question is always I would remove priority from players' draw steps. Yeah, that's that's a because it's only safe ever tr- used. It's only ever used for these awful purposes where you can force them to discard the card that they just drew. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sucks. Yep. It's awful. Yep. Um, I, uh, I've done it to people. Um, I do it, I did it with, I've done it with uh, Modern Living End where you Living End in their draw step and then grief away the card that they just drew. Um, we've done it with Colligan's Command. It sucks. It's so yep. brutal and I, yep. I wish it wasn't part of the game. Um, and it is a very real possibility with this card. Uh, and it, it does exist in Pioneer as well. Um, the uh, Narset plus um, Gyrie Sanitarium. If you can get your opponent empty-handed, you force them to loot in their uh, in their upkeep, and then they don't draw for their draw step. Um, it's brutal. That it's is brutal. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that that actively upsets me. That's not a thing that's supposed to be in the game. <laughs> Yeah, there's a uh, there's a pioneer blue eye control player in my local competitive scene who runs that as his win condition. Um, and yeah, the moment you realise what's just happened, it's not good for you. It's not good for you. Uh, all right, this is this this conversation is going to a dark place. Can you take us somewhere better with your number four, please? Yes, I can take us to the beautiful place of creatureless creature tempo with storm chasers talent. Oh yes, yes. yes. Let's go. One mana for an enchantment that creates a 1-1 one, one otter token with prowess and a whole bunch of other text on the card that does not matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if completely you, agree. If you are ever in a situation with where you're playing this card and then you're spending four mana to upgrade it to level two, something's gone terribly wrong. It's just truly, truly, truly. This is a fantastic fantastic turn one play it's a card that synergizes beautifully with itself it synergizes with every deck that wants to play it and i cannot wait for this to be in standard i'm devastated that it's a rare Mm, because i mean that's you know we just got done with any merc crab 
making life easier for the mono blue players. And now we're in a situation where I just want this one mana one one with prowess, and you're making me craft with a rare wild card for it. Oh, absolutely shame. But I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to get into Storm Chaser's talent being so much fun. I'm already playing the blue tempo deck that is animating artifacts, that is playing one mana one ones, that's playing weird vertical framed cards. That's just, there's something so fun about that. It's novel. It's exciting. It's not what I would say competitively dominant. Certainly. I don't yeah. imagine that Storm Chaser Talent is going to be the head of a deck that's going to start crushing Pro Tours, but it's going to be so much fun. Which every I, card with an auto should be. <laughs> I agree it'll be fun. I wouldn't put money on it crushing the next Pro Tour, but Monastery Swift Spear and um, Soul Scar Mage have been staples of um any sort of prowess deck since both of them were printed um in in both standard and pioneer and i think the question of is storm chaser's talent better than soul scar mage in a blue red deck maybe yeah it's at least close um and and soul scar mage has one pro tours literally one a pro tour um, so there's something here. Um, I mean, if nothing else, we're in a standard with Monastery Swift Spear and Storm Chaser Talent. That's a deck. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, I'm blanking on the name of it right now, but there's, there's another, there's a sorcery that also creates, um, the one, one auto token. Yes. Um, plus your Coruscation Mage. There's a lot of tools for this kind of deck. Uh, and we've got Shock in standard. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a lot of tools all at once. Uh, I'm I'm high on this as well. All right, my number three. Let's uh, let's talk some more exciting cards. Let's talk Lumera Bellow of the Woods. Four green green for a legendary elemental bear. It is a star star with vigilance and reach. It's got power and toughness equal to the number of lands you control. When it enters, mill four cards, then return all land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. I do all of that one breath and now I need to yawn. Um, this is Aftermath Analyst on steroids. Oh, yes. This is very cool. Yes. Um, it's both very cool, very powerful, but also just redundancy. We've mm. now got eight of this effect in standard. Um, we've just lost the Capanna Lands. We do have Fabled Passage. We've got a few others that can potentially work with this. I don't know if we're going to get there in standard just yet we might need to wait for a few more sets to give us a few more tools um but i think this is going to see play in various different modern decks akin to amulet titan that deck already plays um cultivator colossus which has some similarity um i know that dom harvey who is the expert literally wrote the book on amulet titan um has been playing around with uh, a um, an amulet aftermath analyst combo deck, um, which functions kind of similarly to um, to amulet titan, but it has fewer weird combo pieces. Um, and so, if you can get aftermath analyst and lumra in that deck, um, that's very very powerful. Uh, we saw what teamer analyst did most recently in standard. I believe it was the best deck in standard i played it at uh the standard rc um and if man if we had lumra available phew, <laughs> that would have been nuts um not to mention that we do still have uh world souls rage in standard as well yes. so yes. we've got all the tools for a powerful lands based ramp deck um mm -hmm. the question is just are we going to have the actual lands to make it work in standard um failed passage is a great start We'll just have to wait and see what else what else we can get. Um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts for this in, in standard, at least? This When I saw this card for the first time, it's, it's wild to think back how far we've had this as a preview card because this is one of the first Bloomborough preview cards. 
Yeah. And I think at the time, I I certainly didn't, but we might fully have just not known that Aftermath Analyst decks were a thing. You know, we had, at the most, we had me in my short on Nyssa shouting in the, into the void that this is this is snake and nobody's paying any attention to it and even i didn't see that it let you draw into either redundant copies of itself or a creature that you could then crack for all of the lands in the whole world <laughs> yep lumra and- has just continued for me to to just submarine under and i i look at it and i just i can't get my brain to assemble the combos that I know are going to exist with it. Mm. You know, I... But that's that's sort of the situation with Aftermath Analyst. Like, I look at that card and I can see all the parts of it are good. And it's not until you start seeing really skilled people play the deck who have a lot of practice with the deck really show how insane that card is. Like, the kinds of lines that you get where you're looping these insane amounts of land in and out of the graveyard. And then Lumra comes in and Lumra is fuel for that deck. It's a payoff for that deck. Yes. It's just, it's that kind of card where fundamentally you look at it and you go, oh, that's good, I guess. But you're going to have that person that you know who says, no, this card's incredible. And it's like, you know what? I believe you. Because this is your wheelhouse. And, uh, and that's me. Yeah. Well, at least I'm getting there. I'm trying to be yep. great enough to play these decks. <laughs> um, the You're right to point out some of those cards that are still in standard. Nissa still being in standard is massive for these decks. And Lumra is an elemental. Oh, dear. Oh, you're absolutely so Nissa, right. Nissa finds elf or elemental. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aftermath Analyst is an elf. Lumra is an elemental. Um so when I played this deck at the RC, I actually trimmed down to only three Nisses because I wanted to increase the chances that I could hit an Aftermath Analyst off it. Yeah. If you just get to play up to eight copies of that effect, that kind of takes care of itself for you. Um, and then we've seen a couple of different um, a couple of different decks playing... Uh, sorry, I'm blanking on name. Three and a green sorcery return all lands from your graveyard to the battlefield. Um most recently printed in, in Crimson Vow. Um, we've seen a couple of different Pioneer decks um, playing that as a combo piece. Mm. Uh, now, to be fair, part of the value of that as a combo piece is that you can beseech the mirror for it. Um, so Lumra does not necessarily take its place, but Lumra is a different card. This is a finisher as well as just a weird combo piece. Um, and it enables itself just like Aftermath Analyst does. Um, I, don't, I don't fully grasp all the things that this card is going to do, but I think this is going to have an impact in Modern and Pioneer. And depending on the land suite, we can get in Standard standard as well. Absolutely. All of the pieces are there. Um, Nissa, Analyst, Spelunking, mm. that's all there. Mm-hmm. We've just got, to, <clears throat> just got to be able to get the lands themselves going somehow. Um, I will be trying. I will be doing this. Uh, I'm very, very keen to see what's possible. Um, this card is very, very exciting to me. Just as long as we're not doing something silly like uh, playing those car- those black cards that you're uh, sacrificing permanence to for no particular reason other than to enable your very silly combos. I would never do that. No, never. <laughs> Speaking of things that you would never, ever do. Yes. Play my number three card, Ember Heart Challenger. Correct. Which is a two mana, two, two with haste and prowess and if it wasn't already good enough for you whenever it gets a valianted so targeted by a spell or ability for the first time each turn you get to impulse a card now this is the bad version of impulse where you can only play it for the turn that you trigger the effect but i still think that ember heart challenger is an absolutely fantastic card it is going to be a huge part of mono red going forward uh it's going to slot into just the sort of default mono red deck uh right in where bloodthirsty adversary is rotating out uh and i think that that's going to be 
just enough on on its face to talk about the relevance of this card but also the fact that we just got done talking about is there going to be some kind of blue red prowess deck in standard well here's the answer to the uh, the answer is absolutely yes i'm with you i think this 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 is the real deal this is very powerful um the fact the mentioned bloodthirsty adversary compare that to this card bloodthirsty adversary was basically a one on a red two two with haste occasionally you would use its other ability and your opponent would have to mouse over the card because they'd forgotten it even did that um so this is just a better version in two different ways very relevant ways uh yeah i think this is this is going to be the mono red two drop of choice for as long as it's in standard it is kind of insane to think that between this and fugitive code breaker uh we are going into a, a realm of two mana two power creatures with prowess and haste are just a standard thing that we're getting going forward yeah yeah no i completely agree um yeah this this in the in a blue red prowess deck is is interesting um i guess that leads you into playing we've got might of the meek is a a single red cantrip um that can target one of your creatures that plays really nicely with the ember heart challenger and we've also got uh shore up uh, which i think is in standard already Mm-hmm. Um, which plays really nicely with this as well. Uh, that's a that's a very appealing option as well. Um, I really like the idea of that prowess deck, just not having any creatures. It's just <laughs> everything triggers prowess. But man, the Emberheart Challenger is is powerful enough. That yeah, absolutely. It's probably worth including. Absolutely. Even if it's gross, I will never register that card. No, no, sorry. Let me. No, no, that's not fair. That's not fair. Um, this functions similarly to. The, kind of a whole suite of cards that have prowess sort of effects on them um select shot show off included mm. if you play these in mono red you lack moral fiber if you play these in blue red you are very cool and awesome and very hot yeah his That's true colors one. show speaking of my number two is iridescent vine lasher single red one two lizard assassin with offspring two and it has landfall oh isn't that interesting we were talking about landfall before whenever a land you control enters this deals one damage to target opponent now you were talking before or referencing before the pitiless carnage decks um that were uh using the uh, using the uh, aftermath analyst effects um i think that was just a worst version of teamer analyst absolutely not anymore maybe this is this is real um this is a one drop that will kill your opponent um or much like the uh the poor patch guy before um three mana for double the effect um it will not take much to just kill your opponent out of nowhere um there are some sequences of cards that will 16 them on turn four um and the fact that we've got fabled passage in standard means we are potentially um, nugging them for four just with your land drop um, and this card so once again putting all those pieces together Analyst itself, Nissa, Spelunking, Lumra, Vine Lasher uh, Pitiless Carnage find some ways to get some lands in the bin as well, that's a deck that's a very powerful fast difficult to interact with deck and that's just standard. Um, once we hit Pioneer, we've got uh, Scape Shift that we can combine with this as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you can Scape Shift four lands away and bring in four of the Capenna lands, um, then that's eight damage. And if you've got two of these in play already, that's 16. Absolutely. So that's not not unlikely to just kill your opponent with Scape Shift on turn four if they can't remove these. Um I don't know if postmodern horizons modern can tolerate this, but man, it's one mana. I could certainly see it. Um, and obviously, once we're in modern, we've got the fetch lands. Absolutely. Um, so, and again, that that yeah. one for one, three for two, that's extremely relevant. Yeah. Um, do you see this playing outside of a combo deck in standard? 
Can this just go in a black red aggro deck? Well, I mean, I do notice that you. I was waiting for it. I was waiting with bated breath this whole time, uh, but you never looped back to your number eight card, Flame Cache Gecko. Exactly. Which is this just is a one mana. Yeah, yeah. One mana. One mana away that doesn't need the combat step. No, you can just turn two, play the flame, ca- play all of the Flame Cache Geckos in your hand. Yeah. Just because you played yeah. a land for the turn, which is conceptually like that's that doesn't seem fair. That, that seems like that's Tibble tr- trickery levels of polarizing your opening hand matchup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the uh, um, the Warlock, the Thought, the thought Stalker Warlock mm-hmm. um, also works with this as well. So, you know, even if it's a curve of, like, if again, the deck starts to build itself. You've got Eurydice and Vine Lasher, uh, Deep Cabin Bat, Thought Stalker Warlock, uh, and the Gecko. Or there's some, that's some either very fast or very disruptive or both yep. starts out of a out of an aggressive black red deck. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm most excited about this for the combo potential, but that's that's just a little bit more my wheelhouse. But I can definitely see this um going nuts with a card like Gecko as well. Yeah, this card this card almost occupies the same kind of space as Shield Red. Um sure, sorry. Mm. Shield Red of the Apocalypse that Unfortunately, I have to clarify now because we have a shield red in standard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in that, it will just sort of passively end the game. You know, it nugs the opponent for two quite regularly uh, just by sitting on the board and not getting interacted with. It doesn't uh, shore up your defenses the way that shield red does. But generally, you find... A lot of the problem people have with Shield Red is that she punishes you just for existing. Mm. Uh, and, iridescent- and, for, and for trying to find an answer for her. Yeah. And Iridescent Vine Lasher is a similar sort of card that will end the game just by actively not interacting with anybody on the table. Which ultimately makes it the kind of card that is absolutely going to go in every kind of black deck. Because who doesn't want a card that draws so much removal? And again, this is this is an understated part of these offspring cards, is that they're so small, but they are inherently card advantageous. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, we're coming off a standard where finally... Uh, Fable of the Mirror Breaker is rotating out of standard. Um, thankfully banned, but I mean, imagine a world where we had been living with that card and that kind of incidental card advantage all this time. Yeah. Just to come into offspring standard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like that's this, kind of terrifying. Yeah, this is a world where the concept of one-for-one one removal is just... It's pointless. You know, we're we're getting two mana, remove a creature, sorcery speed, but unconditional. And it's mm. the least exciting part of the set, in my opinion. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I almost wanted to put it as an honorable mention because I don't think it's good. Mm, <laughs> it's, I don't it's, think it'll do anything. No, it's just not good. Yeah. Yeah. And that, um, I think it's hilarious that like brand new players to the game will see it and they'll think, oh, this is just a totally normal thing. And it's actually older players who will look at it and part of their brain will be telling them this is a fantastic card and this is overpowered and broken. But it's just not. The new players are like, no, like I just compare it to all this other stuff that exists in the game right now and it's just bad. Yeah. Nope, I'm with you. Yeah, I uh, I don't think... Uh, is it called Fell? Is that what it's called? I believe so, yes. Yeah, I don't think that's good. I also don't think the uh, the blue-blue gift counter spell is good either. Oh, no, um, yes. Uh, a lot of, lot of hype around both those cards, and no, I, I don't think that's where you want to be in, in standard. Um, I want to be I want to be iridescent vine lashing. Um, and hey, to come back to cards that you mentioned before, um, if we can combine this with your... Uh, your your green two mana dork, the Thorn Vault Forager. Turn one, Vine Lasher. Turn two, Forager. Turn three, Heaped Harvest. 
go through that loop that we described before, but every time you're doing it, you're starting to, to nug your opponent. Um, I can see something there as well. I'm very keen to brew with this. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of potential. It's the kind of very fast <clears throat> loop that ends the game before you yeah. get really going particularly quickly. Yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, is this why commander players play with 40 life so that we can dirtle and do the combo thing for slightly longer? Yeah, yeah, we get to do the fun part of magic for longer. All right, what's your number two? Speaking of doing the fun part of magic, my number two is Festival of Embers. Yes, nice. It's a giant red enchantment that has a self-sacrifice activated ability. And if, <laughs> if that doesn't set parts of your brain to party mode, then you haven't lived through the right kinds of standard. No, Festival of Embers is absolutely incredible. During your turn, you may cast instant and sorcery spells from your graveyard by paying one life in addition to their costs. It is just absolutely incredible. If any card or token would be put into your graveyard from anywhere, exile it, sure, whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is you play this card and forever you can play everything that's left in your graveyard. This is the kind of thing that you play and it just instantly flips the game from you being on the back foot to suddenly you have a hand of 17 cards. And it really, really cannot be overstated the power of this kind of effect. I know that Sam, bless his heart, when he saw this, compared it to Past in Flames, and I think that card's fantastic. I think that's wonderful. Yep. I think the fact that Festival of Embers just stays in play, and you can just keep casting just even one giant spell per turn, is fantastic and horrifying, and puts this more in the realm of Fires of Invention. Oh, that's kind of a cool comparison. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um... Did um did Leah see any standard play? Yes. With oh, more or less the same yes. Time? Leah, Disciple of the Drowned, saw just a ton. So Leah, Disciple of the Drowned, was just the core of a number of control decks that I just sort of stopped existing. <laughs> I couldn't. I guess they they became. Uh, they became less exciting as new cards got printed, which is unfortunately just one of the things that happens in Standard. But Leah's still fantastic. There's absolutely no reason why people couldn't be playing Leah right now on best Standard ladder. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic deck. It does incredible, incredible things. And yes, as you've identified, it's the same. I mean, yeah, we, I think, our, I think our, our minds went in different directions when we, we saw this card. To me, this is Past in Flames. Um, I've played Past in Flames in Modern, in Blue Red Gift Storm. I have played, and I still play uh, Leah in um, Pioneer uh, Lotus Field. Um, so, and whenever I'm playing Vintage Cube, I'm often doing silly storm things where um, Yorg will, Underworld Breach, any of these effects um, are the name of the game. So if you are trying to do some sort of storm style combo deck usually the end point is you generate a large amount of mana somehow and then play a card that lets you replay everything from the graveyard again um so anytime we see this effect um it should turn heads um it's been the you know the, i think the first one we saw was your well and it was one of the most broken cards ever exist that's ever been printed um past in flames is likewise just busted underworld breach uh, is banned in Pioneer, has been in the conversation for being banned in Modern. Um, I think it made it through Standard without being banned. But anyway, these cards are just outrageously powerful. Um, but I I hadn't really thought of it, I think, as it sounds like you are, as playing it as a fair card. You can just play it. And then so long as you get to untap with it, yeah, you've got a, you've got a hand of another seven plus cards. Yeah, I absolutely love... This is the kind of thing that when when I say a big, dumb, red enchantment, this is, this is the perfect kind of card. Um, I do worry that when I see an effect like this that it's going to be too much for standard, and I think that's 
entirely a possibility. Like I look at festival members and there's not even really a question of what the combo with it, it will be. It's almost an escape mm. to the wild situation of it's just rate wise too good for standard. The other one that this reminds me of, oddly enough, is um, Experimental Frenzy. Yes. Red card that just let you burn through the top of your deck, but in this case, it's going to let you burn, keyword, through your graveyard um, instead. Uh, mm -hmm. That's good. This is why I like doing this with you, because uh, uh, our minds go in such different directions. I see this as a storm wind condition, whereas you can see this as a... Um, "Quote unquote fair <laughs> card <laughs> as well. Um, uh, I like that pick for for so high up the list. That's um, that's exciting to me. Uh, all right, time to talk about my number one. All right, top of my list. And this was this was not even close for me. I think this is by far the best card in the set. Uh, three Tree City. Yeah, is a legendary land. When it enters, choose a creature type. Tap out a colorless." Two tap, choose a color, add an amount of that color equal to the number of creatures you control of the chosen type. Now, before we go any further, because I'm sure some of the people watching will have hesitations, complaints about this card, I'd like to read some comments from Reddit. Oh, dear. <clears throat> um, I hate this as in I think it's not too good, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. You need four for it to actually generate mana. Oh, dear. Second comment. Just to clear the air, this is to Cabal Coffers what Glimmer Void is to Telerian Academy. Third comment. This card's best days are pretty good days. Its worst days are abject failures. It's such a win more card that it's sickening. Fourth comment. Whilst it's hard for cards like these to be bad, I have a sneaking suspicion this one has managed it. Win more when you're ahead. Game loosing when you're behind. Pretty sure this one's a newbie trap. All four of those comments were real comments on Reddit in the preview thread for Nykthos Shrine to Nyx. A card that I don't think I need to expand upon I, all too much. I completely fell for that. I'm so <laughs> mad. <laughs> Nykthos oh. obviously is... Uh, incredible in commander it is has been on the verge of being banned in pioneer it has already got khan great creator banned from pioneer um and that that deck will not die it was a player in modern uh many years ago i don't need to go on about how nykthos is busted that's what people said about nykthos when it was first printed and when three tree city was previewed people said very similar things yeah you need quite a lot of creatures in play for it to do the thing and until then it's not very good I think that's the wrong way to look at this kind of card. Any single land that taps for a large amount of mana is broken. Mm -hmm. I don't believe there are any exceptions. I remember mentioning this to someone when we were talking about this card, and he came back a few moments later and said, I just did a scryfall search to try to prove you wrong, and I couldn't find anything. Yeah. Yep. Lands that tap for multiple mana, especially if by multiple we mean 10... Are busted. The fact that people were arguing mm -hmm. over whether this is, um, like, there were, there were people trying to make the point that Gaia's Cradle is better than this. Wake up! Hello. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm sorry. Yeah, reality check. What conversation are we having here? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is a card. So, this is a card being printed into standard, and you're comparing yeah. it to Gaia's Cradle. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about this. This is not. The card that you're going to play in your regular standard tribal deck that's going to play a two drop, a three drop, and a four drop. That's not how to use this. This card demands something very specific. And I think this is actually more of a tokens card oh, absolutely. than it is a traditional tribal card. So the trick is not which existing deck can I slot this in? It's what can I do around this so that this generates a billion mana? And then what do I do with a billion mana? Mm -hmm. Um I don't think that question is that hard to answer. We've all seen boards that have seven one one soldier tokens or insect tokens or whatever, um, even zero one plant tokens. Um, and if you can find a way to make that happen reliably, then the three tree city is paying you off 
with an immense amount of mana. And if mono green decks can work out a way to get 14 green pips onto the battlefield to power Nykthos, I reckon we can get enough creatures into play with the same type to make 3 Tree City the same sort of power level. It's a different card to Nykthos. It's not going to be the same kind of deck, just like it's not Gaia's Cradle or anything else. Um, though I do think the decks will look more similar to Gaia's Cradle than, than Nykthos decks. Oh, certainly. Um, yeah. I I can only imagine asking, say, a modern player how difficult would it be to generate say incidental creature tokens at this particular point in modern's history you know can can we yep. imagine a situation where the the board might become flooded with creature tokens for any particular reason and then we would yep. just have all of the mana that we ever needed that's it and you get to choose a color for it as well. So that means that if the win condition for your deck is a different color to the rest of your deck, this solves that problem as well. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's worth noting anyone who's played with a card like Nykthos or Gaia's Cradle uh, will know that the trick with these cards is you don't just use it once. Um, you try and get multiple activations out of it. You untap it somehow, you flicker it in oh, and yes. out, you flip cards off the top to get another one into play and mm-hmm. just keep going. Um, I think I think anyone who is trying to downplay the power level of this uh, is going to end up sounding like uh, the four Reddit commenters from 10 years ago <laughs> that I read out just a moment ago did. I look forward to the version of this deck that you are going to assemble in the future that contains this and then also Nissa and Aftermath Analyst and Spelunking and Lumra. How do we combine tokens with this? I got a brute. This is exciting. Um... I'm sure we can find at some point in standard we'll get uh, an effect that turns... uh, lands into creatures again I know Uh, there's one in DMU do we have one yeah we have um... Tatiova no yes did I get it right first time (laughs) yeah I'm going to have to do some scryfall searching on that front Um, and the other point with this card is it's going to get it's going to get better the bigger the card pool i think as well so i think this will this will oh, probably absolutely. see its best home in oh, commander um well. but aside from that <laughs> pioneer um so standard i think it'll see play i think it'll do things in standard there's a, a heavy tokens theme in bloomborough as it is um so i do think it will see standard play i think it'll see more in pioneer where nykthos is already dominating um modern probably has better mana engines but um, yeah, I think the the comparisons to Cradle and Nykthos are not one to one, but the power level, I think, is is comparable. the The question with this card is not what existing decks does it push over the edge, or what existing decks does it sort of enable. It is what previously just completely unviable strategy suddenly snaps into top tier competitive relevance now that this card exists yes exactly this this is a bridge from below this this is a card that fundamentally enables a kind of play that other other cards can't replicate that is one of the things that like like that's part of a constructed game like magic where there's so many different ways to do things that sometimes the best part of a card is that it does three different things and they all happen to be on this one card in particular sometimes you get a card like three tree city like nykthos that just it does a thing that doesn't happen anywhere else in the game and that fundamentally will create a whole new archetype as a result and 
Like, if that's not at least in your top 10, then what are you doing? He said, with Three True City not in his top 10, because he's <laughs> not that kind of deck builder. Oh, that was going to be an amazing segue to that being your number one as well. No, <laughs> no. My number one is straight... Compared to Three True City, my number one is a straight up meme. Because Go, hit me. My number one is Jackdaw Saviour. Wow. So Jackdaw Saviour, for those of you who don't know what this card is, because it's not it's not a big deal. This is a 3-1 bird cleric with flying for two and a white. So three mana. Whenever it or another creature that you control with flying dies, return another creature card with lesser mana value from your graveyard to the battlefield. So the reason that this is my number one is a very similar sort of vibe to Three Tree City. It is in no way the same kind of latent potential power that Three Tree City has. But Jackdaw Savior is the kind of card that is going to hit standard and there's going to be a brief period where people aren't really sure what to do with it. And then there's going to be a white and some other color flying creatures deck that just takes over the standard ladder because this card is by itself just surprisingly powerful as a 3-1 flyer for three mana it's going to end games quite quickly but also the fact that it's so hard to remove is an effect that Again, it's unique. It's the kind of thing that we don't have in every standard. And doubly so. One of its natural predators is rotating out of standard. Kumano faces Kakazan would be the card that makes Jackdaw Savior unplayable because it would just incidentally be in 30% of all decks causing all of your creatures to get exiled instead of dying and triggering this properly. Uh, Kumano's yeah. rotating out. Now the card that we're worried about is Sunfall. And I mean, we were already worried about Sunfall. Everyone's worried about Sunfall. So do you see this as the... Uh, as a centerpiece in a like a mid-range flyers sort of deck? Or do you see this as a like a synergy combo piece this is the so fundamentally it's a mid-range piece like it's it's one of those things that at its floor it just makes an extremely resilient deck that ends the game like quickly but not instantly in that way that creates a situation where the floor of the deck is so high that it doesn't matter that actually the ceiling of the deck is actually quite low. We've got this narrow band deck that's actually just really consistent. It's really in the middle of everything. And that is the kind of deck that really can shift an environment because it's easy when you have a deck in the format that has a lot of peaks and a lot of troughs to just let the deck self-destruct sometimes when you play against it and continue doing your own thing. A Jackdaw Savior deck is going to play through basically every kind of removal. And also, if it needs to, it's just going to interact on the board with you. It is really going to force a particular style of play, especially in best of one. Now, I don't know that that's going to be reflected in quote-unquote real magic. <laughs> but it's going to be a huge deal on ladder. And I really do think that the only thing that's going to stop that from being the case day one, week one, is the fact that people are going to still look at this card and think that Kumano or some effect like Kumano is going to be a relevant presence on the best of one ladder. I mean, rest in peace is in standard. You know, rest in peace obviously completely hoses this card. Nobody plays it on ladder. 
I don't know what kind of degenerate loops are going to be potentially made with this card. He says, as a person who back in the day played uh, Pyre Clerics, <laughs> which used this exact kind of effect. Oh, yeah, I remember that deck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's like, that's people having fun building silly things. The power of Jack Savior is this incredible consistency that it's going to have. This is cool. Yeah, this was not really on my radar all that much. I'm, I know that there's an infinite combo with it, with a sack outlet and uh, another card that I am blanking on, um, which did catch my eye but didn't seem particularly competitive. But yeah, once again, your your perspective of looking at things in a um, in a more fair light. Is um is really shining through here, um. Yeah, that's yeah, very much not on my radar. So I'm I'm really curious to see if you're if you're right on this one. I I love sitting down like this and just comparing not just the different kinds of formats that we play, but also just fundamentally the the styles of play that we enjoy and that we are immersed in. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and what's really fun about this is we did not set this up this way before we sat down and started recording. We had a conversation about what we should do if we both have the same card on our lists in different positions. This this was a genuine surprise to us. Not, 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 neither of us knew what was coming on these lists. Um, and aside from me mentioning Ember Heart Challenger in passing earlier on, mm-hmm. we had no overlap. Yep. We had no overlap. We both had completely different perspectives on how this set is going to affect... Uh, constructed um, yeah because as you said we, we engage with the game in, in slightly different ways in slightly different formats um, and even just in, in terms of standard the uh, the best of one arena ladder is different to um, kind of competitive best of three standard um, and that's that's thrilling to me that we had we had 10 different takes as to the best 10 cards in this set absolutely um, what a time to be alive that's, uh, that's fantastic magic's better than it's ever been that's my hot take, and it's going to be my hot take for a long time, I think. Uh, look, I'm a drafter, primarily, oh. um, and uh, Limited is has been at, at an all-time high for the last four or five years. Um, Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. People, people love to doom and gloom it online, but Magic's great. I love this game. <laughs> Those of you who are still watching at this stage of the video, thank you for staying with us until the very end. Please like the video and subscribe to the Draft Punks. Go over and see these fine fellows for their fine regular magic content. A feat that I really, really boggles my mind the extent to which you guys are able to just generate such quality magic with such consistency yeah so we uh for those for those that don't know us yeah we um we do uh a draft video every week and i say weeks there are two of us on that channel uh, i run it with my my partner adrian um so if you if you like the sort of uh two-person banter that you got a bit of a taste of here um you you might enjoy what we do we've got it we have a draft video that comes out every week and then um, we have some bonus content that we try to get out on a regular basis as well. Most recent one was a pre-release guide for Bloomborough. So if you're trying to get a, a handle on what to look for at your local pre-release that you could be heading to this weekend, um, please check that out. It's doing some numbers at the moment, which is great. Uh, we do some other stuff as well. I do, I've do. i done interviews with um, Simon Nielsen analyzing drafts from the Pro Tours. We've done silly meme draft formats uh, and such as well um we we just love doing doing all sorts of fun fun stuff related to draft mix of strategy mix of fun and entertaining um so yeah we'd love for you to join us over there and subscribe to michael (laughs) there we go we brought even though i don't want you to have him overtake us any more than he already has but it's just a rounding error now who cares no we're all friends here we're all part of the magic youtube community Rising tide lifts all um, bloats, etc. But just to shout out Michael as well, if you are new to Michael's channel, uh, go check out his shorts section because he does a review of every rare and mythic in every standard set as they come out. 
short and sweet and always very entertaining. Uh, so if you if you enjoy Michael's perspective on um, standard and arena standard uh, and his thoughts on kind of design philosophy as well, um, yeah, please make sure you subscribe to Michael and uh, yeah, lift that tide that rises all lifts boats. It is so late. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, cool. I, don't, I really hope you cut the video right there.